very much if you can do this without your support. And it's great. It's great to see a, a packed uh, auditorium here. I know the astronomy lectures are among our most popular. Um, this started as an astronomy series in 2009, uh, but then we've really featured science from across campus, including um, Professor Kathy Collins' great talk uh, this year on uh, aging versus immortality, how uh, the struggle between cells controlling their ability to reproduce um, and, and not turning into cancer, but also kind of the senescence of cells, how cells die off, and what's being done in research at UC Berkeley to really understand how we can live long, healthy lives um, and, and control cancers. Uh, there's some fantastic research, you know, again, kind of broader across the, um, the life sciences and across um, kind of the interface between the life sciences and biology and engineering. We've had talks in previous years. Uh, one that st sticks in my mind is Professor Hamayun Kazaruni, who was talking about uh, how you can build exoskeletons. Um, and actually, there was, a, I think, a graduate student in his group who was working. He'd been paralyzed in a car accident uh, from the waist down several years prior. And he stood up and walked at graduation um, uh, with the help of this um, robotic exoskeleton that was designed and built at UC Berkeley. I think that's the only Science at Cal lecture series where I've seen a substantial fraction of the audience almost in tears before they left the auditorium. And I don't know uh, whether Ryan is going to <laughs> quite whip up your emotions so much today. But I would encourage you, please, uh, if you're not already signed up for our mailing list, um, we have these lectures every month except for April when UC Berkeley has its big Cal Day open house. And I hope that you'll, uh, you'll come back, that you'll sign up to hear about um, more of the great research that's taking place on campus. Um, so before we go on, uh, since this is an astronomy talk today, I should wish you all a uh, happy solstice for tomorrow. I hope you all have your solstice plans uh, in place. Um, also, kind of while we're talking about uh, astronomy and related topics, um, who of you here has uh, the SETI at Home screensaver running on your computers at home? Small handful. <laughs> Who of you here has heard of the SETI at Home screensaver? Okay. So SETI at Home is based up at the UC Berkeley Space Sciences Lab, uh, and it's a project to take data from the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico and from the Green Bank Telescope uh, in West Virginia, and to process that looking for signals of extraterrestrial life. It's actually one of the biggest distributed computing um, endeavors in the world. Uh, it kind of ranks up there with many supercomputers, but it's just people with their home computers kind of crunching data on behalf of folks here at Berkeley. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I'm helping um, this group with some of their outreach, and they're actually auctioning off some of the original uh, servers from, I think, from like 1999, 2000, something like that. So you can own a machine that was responsible for one third of the traffic of the University of California, Berkeley at the time, one third of the internet traffic. The cool thing about this also is that it comes with a tour, a personalized tour of the Space Sciences Lab. You get to meet the SETI at Home team. So I knew that there'd be some SETI at Home enthusiasts in the audience. Um, the information, again, is online. I'm sure you'll find it easily or, or, or drop me an email. Um, I should mention who I am. Most of you probably know who I am. I, I'm Steve Croft. Uh, I coordinate these series, and I'm a researcher in the Department of Astronomy, uh, same department here as, as Ryan on campus. Um, we do video all of these talks. We post them online uh, on our YouTube. Uh, and I'd like to thank Jeffrey, who is uh, volunteering to help us out uh, with the video this time. <laughs> so go online and check those out. You can check out uh, Professor Collins' talk. You can check out Professor uh, Kazaruni's talk and all the other t or most of the other talks going back now uh, till 2009. Uh, next month, we have um, Nadav Sorek. Uh, who will be talking about biofuels and DNA sequencing, two sides of the same coin. So really this is kind of uh, weaning us off um, fossil fuels and using kind of renewable energy, but also how the, the DNA sequencing revolution is, is helping with that. We're moving back next month into uh, genetics and plant biology just across the way. There's a little kind of green area outside. Some of you will remember that lecture theater from last year. So we're going to be in there from next month if you come here. You'll have a nice view of a blank screen, and uh, Nadav will be about 100 feet that way. But uh, um, come check us out next month. So I'm, I realize uh, you know, I don't want to eat too much into Ryan's time here. Uh, so uh, it's, it's great here to have Dr. Ryan Trainer again, getting back to the topic of astronomy. Uh, Ryan did his undergrad at UC Irvine. He did his master's and PhD at Caltech. And I guess because he couldn't bear to leave California, he came up uh, to be a Miller Fellow here at UC Berkeley. Um, and he's working on galaxy formation, which is what he's going to tell us about today. So, pleasure, Ryan. Thank you.
Hello? Um, does this seem like it's picking up the microphone? Great. Um, yes, thanks so much, Steve. Um, thanks, Science at Cal. Uh, really excited to uh, be a part of this program here. Um, as Steve mentioned, yeah, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Miller Institute um, for Basic Science and Research at, here at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm an astrophysicist or astronomer, and I study galaxy formation, and so that's what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. Um, this idea of how do we grow a galaxy, how do galaxies grow. Um, and I want to start with the end, more or less. Um, this is uh, a picture that is, is a very famous picture, actually. Many of you may have seen it before. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, it's one of the deepest images of space that we've ever taken as humanity uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and what you see here is an array of galaxies um, of different sizes, shapes, and colors, and distances. Um, you see blue galaxies that are forming stars actively, red galaxies that are evolving passively, um, and a finished forming stars. You see very young galaxies and old galaxies. And this is what the universe looks like today, more or less. Um, and this is what we're trying to understand. How does the universe get from a fiery explosion in the Big Bang to this uh, complex array of structures and galaxies that we see in the universe? What are the processes that drive this evolution? What are the important components that we have to integrate into any theory that can sec successfully explain galaxy formation and evolution? Um, that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm going to start, however, um, by just talking about what galaxies are. Uh, what are they made of? What are the primary components that shape their behavior and uh, images and their evolution? <laughs> uh, next, I'm going to present uh, what is our, our current uh, best theories for a galaxy evolution, um, how they go, grow through this whole process of going from the Big Bang um, to the galaxies we see today. Um, and finally, I'm going to describe how we've arrived at that story and that narrative, um, the techniques uh, that we use and the current research that's going on um, to learn more and more about uh, the growth of these galaxies. This last part of the talk will be the most technical, um, but uh, hopefully we can, we can all uh, come away with a better understanding of, of how the universe got to look the way that it does and how we know about it. Um, so let's start. What are galaxies made of? Um, when you think of a galaxy, uh, the, the first thing that might come to mind are stars. And, a, you know, at a fundamental level, galaxies are collections of stars held together by gravity. But there are other really important components of galaxies as well. For instance, gas in galaxies. Gas is what forms stars. So if you don't have gas in your galaxies, you won't get stars. Um, we also have dust in our galaxies. Um, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but uh, dust is produced by stars, um, and it, it plays a, certain, a strong role in the way that galaxies look. Um, and it also plays a, an important role in the formation of planets and other solid bodies in the galaxy. And all of these three things we can observe uh, with telescopes. There are also some more exotic components of our galaxies um, that nonetheless uh, play a very important role in their evolution, despite the fact that we have to study them in very different ways. Uh, one of those is dark matter, um, and the last I'll talk about are black holes. And so all five of these things play a very important role how our galaxies look and how they grow over time. Uh, so let's begin now a, a little closer to home. Um, if you take an image or look out into the sky on a very dark night, you might see something that looks like this. So this is a picture I took on the big island of Hawaii. Um, I'll talk a little bit more later about why astronomers like myself spend a lot of time in Hawaii. It's not because of the beaches. Uh, or not only because of the beaches. Um, here, down here, you see light from Kona. Uh, one of the towns on, on the island. If you look up, you see a lot of stars, and you see uh, this kind of amorphous structure up here. And if I tilt my camera a little bit higher to cut out the light from the town, uh, we see that that amorphous blob is actually the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. And so you're seeing um, billions of stars. Well, you can't see it, billions of them, but you're seeing a lot of stars out here. Uh, the stars are especially concentrated in this disk of the Milky Way. But you also see there are these dark patches uh, yeah, along that disk. And these dark er the dark areas here are dark because there aren't a lot of stars outside of the disk. But the dark areas in the middle are not because of the lack of stars. They're because there are dust particles that obscure our view of the center of our galaxy. And these dust particles look something like this. They're very similar to dust particles that we have on Earth. 
cosmic dust isn't that much different from uh, the dust that we have on Earth, and that's because the Earth is made of particles like this that clump together and coagulate over time and build up large um, rocky planets and things like that in our universe. Um, so dust plays an important role in getting us to where we are today, but from the point of view of studying our galaxy, it mostly obscures our view of the center of our own galaxy. Um, also, there's some people standing on the edges. If there are empty seats in the middle and you guys maybe want to squeeze towards the middle, it might make it a little bit easier for people to sit down. Um, so, uh, because of this dust, it actually is rather difficult to study our own galaxy in optical light, especially looking towards the center. And so, in some ways, it's easier to see the structure of galaxies by looking outside of our own and looking at galaxies uh, that are relatively close by, but we can see from the outside. So if we could get outside of our Milky Way and look back at it, we might see something that looks like this. This is uh, a galaxy called uh, Messier 83, it's a creative name, uh, based on the fact that it was the 83rd galaxy in the catalog of Messier. Um, it also has a slightly more uh, interesting name, the Southern Pinwheel, uh, which is because, as you can see, it has this beautiful spiral shape. Um, it has these spiral arms that look very similar to what we expect the spiral arms of our own uh, Milky Way galaxy look like. This is a very typical grand design spiral galaxy, as we call it. And so what you can see now is that this galaxy has a disk, it has these spiral arms um, that we can see in dust, which is obscure in our view of the stars, which we see in blue here. The starlight is given in blue. If we zoom in on this arm of uh, M83, we can see, again, these, these uh, dust features uh, tracing the spiral arms, we see the stars in blue, and then in red, this is hot gas that's being excited by the presence of newly forming stars in these regions. And so, um, this, by looking at this hot gas, we can see how uh, stars are affecting the gas around them and how that gas is forming stars, um, and, and the role, of the, the interplay of those two components of the galaxy. Um, but again, this is this is hot gas that we're seeing that's excited by stars. Do you have a question? So we see that something that big at that distance, those, those red areas have to be huge. They are. How large are those? Um, hundreds of light years across uh, oh, to a thousand light years. I mean, if you were there, what would you be seeing? Um, you would see, it would look very diffuse. So that's the thing, because um, this, there, these areas are very large and there's a lot of gas in them, but that gas is very spread out. So generally speaking, if you were, if you were there, unless you integrated for a very long time with the telescope, um, it would probably actually be very hard to see with your naked eye. Um, but again, this, this is just the hot gas in the galaxy. There's also a lot of gas that's not being excited by stars, and this is the gas that's going to be flowing into the galaxy and forming new stars. And we can see that gas, too, um, by looking at the radio wavelengths. So it turns out that most of the um, gas in the universe is hydrogen, um, and we that hydrogen emits this very, very faint signal in the radio. Um, and uh, so if we zoom out from our picture of our galaxy, this is that whole galactic disk that I showed you. This is now a UV image of that galaxy. Um, so all the stars are around here. And then much more extended in red, we have hydrogen gas around this galaxy that we can see with radio telescopes. There are. Yeah, exactly. And much of what we know about the way that stars yes. form from gas come from studying nearby regions like that in our galaxy. One of the most famous is the Orion Nebula, which is in the belt of the Orion constellation. And that's one of the closest uh, uh, star-forming regions in our own galaxy. So it would look sort of like that? It would look very similar to that, exactly. It had big bubbles that are being blown out by the stars that are forming. Um, so here, so now I've talked about the, the three components of our galaxies that we can see easily in light. So we have stars, we have dust, we have gas. Um, now I'm going to move on to some of the more exotic components of our galaxies. Um, the first of which is dark matter. Um, dark matter is an area of a lot of current research. It's something that we don't understand uh, very well. We're not sure what it's made of. What we know about dark matter is that there's a lot of it in the universe. It makes up most of the stuff in the universe, at least uh, the matter in the universe. Um, and it uh, causes gravity, it produces gravity, so it has mass. Um, but it doesn't seem to interact with uh, light at all. It doesn't interact with the electromagnetic spectrum at all, which is why we can't see it. It's what we call it dark matter. Um, 
and sometimes I talk to people and they don't like the idea of dark matter. They don't like the idea of there being something in the universe that we can't see. Um, and you know that, that seems kind of fishy or made up, but the, the fact is that we see things or we observe things in our daily experience that we can't see directly all the time. If I look out the window of my kitchen into our garden, I can very easily tell if it's windy outside. And I can't see the wind, but I can see the effect of the wind on trees, on leaves, and so I can infer that there must be something driving these interactions that I can't see, and it's just the same way that we can infer the existence of dark matter even though we can't detect it directly. So, so do you have a question in the back? Uh, yeah. When exactly was dark matter discovered and how did it do That's an excellent question. One of the ways it was discovered is by looking <laughs> at the <laughs> rotation curves of galaxies. No, that's an excellent question and well-timed. So, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, the, the dark, you know, some evidence that there was something that was producing gravity we couldn't see has been uh, kind of seen over the course of the last century, but most of the really conclusive work on this was done during the 60s and 70s, um, particularly by this woman named Dr. Vera Rubin. Um, and uh, she and others uh, looked at the uh, rotation curves of galaxies. So they looked at galaxies, spiral galaxies like our, our own, and how, galaxy, how stars were moving around them, because these uh, stars orbit the centers of their galaxies much in the same way that our Earth orbits the sun. Um, and, what, and it turns out that if, if you've ever taken a weight on a rope or something like that and swung it around your head, you'll find that the faster you swing it, the more it pulls, and the harder you have to pull it back to keep it from flying away. And in a similar way, the faster stars are moving around the center of a galaxy, it takes more gravitational force to hold them together. So by looking at how quickly the stars are moving around these galaxies, we can infer how much gravitational force is holding them in and how much mass it would take to, to produce that gravitational force. And what we see is that when we measure um, the, uh, rot the uh, velocities of stars in these galaxies starting in the center and moving our way out, that the velocities increase as you go out, and then they stay very flat as you move over toward the edges of this galaxy. However, if we just count up the mass that we can see in stars, gas, dust, in these galaxies, and produce, say how much gravitational force should that create, how high of velocities of these stars should that allow, we get a curve that looks like this red curve. And so there is much, these stars are moving much faster than we expect, which means that there must be more gravitational force holding them together than we realize. And that is one of the primary pieces of evidence we have <laughs> for the existence of dark matter. Uh, what does it seem that the, uh, the stuff that we can see is more concentrated in the center? That's exactly and so. Why, if it's gravitational, why is it so much out there? Uh, right. That's, a, that's an excellent question. I'll come to that a little bit more in the talk. But it basically, because uh, the normal matter, what we call baryonic matter, can interact with itself in a way that dark matter can't, uh, dark and it's able to emit light. The uh, baryonic matter can emit energy and lose energy, which allows it to come towards the center of the galaxy, whereas dark matter has no way of doing that, so it stays out on the outskirts. Yeah. So these galaxies, these spiral galaxies, are intuitively, if the entire galaxy is spinning at the same speed, unexpected to change its <coughs> shape, what keeps it a spiral? Excellent question as well. It turns out that these spiral arms are not necessarily long-lived. They don't just move around in a fixed you know, uh, shape, but rather that they, they're constantly kind of forming and, and changing in time as these density waves kind of travel through the galaxy. So that's a good point. Uh, maybe one more question on this so one. you included gas and dust from this thing you talked about the stuff that you see. Of course, gas and dust doesn't radiate. How could they be sure that it wasn't just gas and dust that it accounted for the dark matter? That's a good question. So, Gas does radiate. As I showed previously, we can use radio observations to, to get a very good idea of how much gas is in these uh, galaxies. It also turns out that dust radiates as well. So as I said, the, the dust you know, obscures our view of these stars. It absorbs the light from these stars. But they can't, it can't just keep absorbing light forever. It has to emit light. And so it doesn't emit that light in the visible part of the spectrum, but it emits it far in the infrared. And so if we take images, actually, if I showed you those same clouds I showed you previously, in an infrared image, we would see those dark spots in the optical as bright in the infrared. And so by using those techniques, we can actually get a very strong measurement of how much gas is in these galaxies. And in particular, it turns out that dust in particular is only about 1% of the mass of the gas in the galaxy, typically. Um, but 
But this isn't our only uh, evidence for dark matter either. Another very strong piece of evidence for dark matter comes from looking at galaxy clusters. So just as a galaxy is a collection of stars moving together, a galaxy cluster is a group of galaxies moving together in the same gravitational field. And so what you see here is an image of a, of a galaxy cluster. Each of these kind of fuzzy things is a different galaxy. And we can, just as we can measure the, the motions of stars in a galaxy, we can motion, uh, measure the motion of galaxies in this galaxy cluster. And just as they do in the case of galaxies, we can see these galaxies and clusters are moving way too fast for the amount of gravity that we see to hold them together. If there were only stars and gas in these uh, clusters, then those clusters would immediately just fly apart as everything moved, moved away. Um, and so that, again, provides a strong constraint that the vast majority of matter in these clusters is dark matter. But I just, I was, well, one more thing about these clusters is that we have another, the nice thing about these clusters is there's a second independent way to figure out how much mass is in them um, that doesn't rely on the motions of things. And that's because, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, that uh, mass actually distorts space and causes uh, light to travel in bent patterns. And so what you can actually see a little bit in this image is you get these streaky things that look kind of like this. There's some down here. And if you, if you kind of look, you can see that around this galaxy, see if there are this cluster, there are all these kinds of streaks that all follow kind of a circular pattern. And those are all... Um, coming from galaxies and objects that are behind the cluster, and their light is being bent around this cluster and stretched out. And because we have the theory of relativity, we can very precisely calculate how much mass it takes to deform and warp the light from these galaxies in that precise way. And again, that gives us a very accurate measurement of the mass in these clusters directly, which agrees with kinematic information and tells us, again, that the vast majority of matter in these clusters and in the universe is dark matter. So uh, almost none in the plane of the sky. So we don't see this galaxy moving in this direction. But it turns out by using spectra of these galaxies, because if galaxies are moving towards us, the light coming from them gets compressed, like a Doppler shift. Um, we can measure the shifts of those, of those light. We can measure the, um, the velocities going towards us or away from us much better than we can measure the velocities tangentially to us. Um, and so those. Uh, velocities tell us that these galaxies are typically moving at around a thousand kilometers per second. So it's huge velocities that we're measuring. I haven't heard you, or maybe I missed it, I haven't heard you discuss the role of the black hole in you know, all of this. I had it, but that's the next slide. So <laughs> I'll get there very shortly. Okay, one more question. Um, the dark matter. Um, I assuming, I'm assuming that it must be clustered towards the center of the galaxy. So actually, for these galaxies, it tends to be more extended than, uh, than the gas that was, I was describing. It, it's, it's kind of what we call a dark matter halo, where most of it is uh, much more extended than uh, the, the stars in the galaxy. But then, but then how is it affecting the, the rotation? If it's, I would think it would have to be clustered in right. one place to affect the, to, to have a so, total... The main thing, so as we see here, so in, in clusters, it's a little bit different, and it is more centrally concentrated in clusters, but, um, uh, sorry, but here, uh, what you're seeing is that in the inner part of the galaxy, our measured and our calculations agree very well, and that's because most of the mass in the center of the galaxy is stuff that we can see from the, the stars. It's as you move out farther from the galaxy that these start to diverge, which is because the, gal the dark matter is much more extended. So in the centers of galaxies, you're mostly dominated by uh, by the gravity from stars, except for um, uh, an effect of black holes. I'm actually, I, I want to move on just because there's uh, a lot of things to get through, but uh, there will definitely be time for questions at the end. Um, so we have these clusters. Now I want to turn to that final component of galaxies that I mentioned, black holes. Um, and black holes, uh, we expect, are produced um, from the deaths of very massive stars. So when a massive star uh, has a supernova, the very most massive stars may form a black hole upon their death. Um, and so that, that's, uh, we can you know, try to produce that in simulations and things like this, but our strongest observational evidence for black holes actually comes from observations of the center of our own galaxy. 
Um, and if you look, if you zoom in on the very center of our Milky Way galaxy, uh, what you see is that right in the middle there's a very dense cluster of stars. There are a bunch of stars very close together moving around very quickly. And there's been uh, some different teams that have been studying this cluster at the center of our galaxy for a long time. Uh, one of the major ones is uh, at UCLA, led by uh, Andrea Gez. And this team, for the last 20 years, has been taking images of the center of our galaxy and the stars that are closest to the center of that cluster uh, several times a year over the course of the past 20 years. Um, and because these stars are so much closer than those, uh, uh, the other galaxies, we actually can, because we have very fine images of these stars, we actually can detect the motion of these stars over time. So when you combine these images taken over 20 years and you track the stars over time, what you see is these stars are moving around the center of the galaxy. And in particular, when the stars get close to the very middle, they do some strange things. They move very quickly. And so by studying the, the motions of all these stars, it's become very, very clear that most of the stars at the very center of our galaxy are orbiting around something that we can't. Um, and in fact, we do see a little bit of radio emission from this object, but we don't see it. It's definitely not a star. Uh, and in fact, uh, we can measure from these orbits exactly how much mass it would take to make these stars move in the way they do. And it's about four million times the mass of the sun. And because these stars get so close to that center, we can very uh, precisely say how, uh, how close together, how dense that mass is. And the only way to get four million times the mass of the sun in an area that small is by having a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And it turns out that we can look at other galaxies and look at the stars at the center of those galaxies and we can see similar things. Or we can look at the motions of gas in the centers of some galaxies. Um, and again, we see that most galaxies, at least massive galaxies that we can see around us, all have a supermassive black hole at their center. Um, but we can only see uh, these kinds of effects on galaxies that are fairly close by, where we can actually get a really nice view of the very center of those galaxies. Um, but it turns out that we can also learn about black holes at the centers of other galaxies that are much farther away, but they're a slightly different type of black hole than in ours. Our black hole is, is a very passive black hole. Um, it doesn't seem to be sucking up very much matter, and so that's because these stars, even though they're getting relatively close to it, they're not actually crossing the horizon that would cause them to be disrupted and, uh, and accreted by this black hole. Um, however, we know that, we, we believe, I should say, that, that black holes are created from the deaths of massive stars, and these black holes start with masses that are 10 or maybe 100 times the mass of the sun. So in order to get from there to 4 million times the mass of the sun, these black holes have to grow over time. And the way that black holes grow is by absorbing matter, which adds to their mass and causes them to grow. <coughs> So we know that even though our black hole is not absorbing a lot of material right now, it must have absorbed it in the past. And when black holes absorb material, um, they look very different. Um, they look something often like this. So there's a class of black holes called quasars, which are, are not fundamentally different from black holes like our own, other than the fact that they are in the process of accreting material. And so uh, when you get a lot of material close to a black hole, um, what you find is that this material that starts out very dispersed has to get squeezed down to a very small region in order to fall into the black hole. And when it does that, when you squeeze that material, frictional forces operate among everything trying to squeeze down to the center, and that material, that gas, heats up. It heats up to tens or hundreds of millions of degrees. Um, and so that produces such hot material that it emits a lot of light that then we can see from very far away. So again, we can't see the black hole directly, um, but we can see very, very hot material around these black holes um, out to very long distances. Do you have a question about that? Do black holes occur anywhere else besides the center of the galaxy? Good question. So um, as far as we know, galaxies have supermassive black holes in their centers, and generally they'll only have one supermassive black hole unless you had two galaxies that recently <coughs> merged together and then they're, they're black holes. That black holes will eventually merge themselves over time, but if there's a very recent merger, you could have multiple ones. We also expect, and we see, that there are smaller black holes, ones that are more like the 10 solar mass size that I described earlier, that it can occur anywhere in the galaxy, wherever a very massive star has died. Um, but I want to return for a moment 
just to this, uh, this accretion disk, as we call it, that is the very hot material around uh, these black holes. And because it's this accretion disk um, that uh, or is part of the motivation for uh, a recent very famous image that some of you may have seen of a black hole, it looked like this. Um, this, if you haven't seen it, is an image from the movie Interstellar. Um, somewhat famously, this image is the result of an extremely state-of-the-art simulation of what a black hole might actually look like if you encountered it in space. And what you're seeing here in black is the edge of the black hole, the edge at which once something falls into that, you can't see it anymore. It's in that black hole forever. Um, but as you see here, there's also this disk of very hot material spiraling around, heating up as it tries to fall into the black hole. And what you're seeing up here, up here and down here, is not actually stuff that's above and below the black hole. Again, as I mentioned, when you have something very massive, it warps light. And so if you look up, uh, to the top of the black hole, what happens is that the light actually bends down, and you can see the back of the accretion disk by looking over or above um, the black hole. And so that's why you see, you can see these look like mirror images of each other, because you're seeing the same disk from above and below as that light is being warped. And so now if you pick up Interstellar on DVD, and you're watching it with family and friends, you can pause it right here and talk for five to ten minutes about it. <laughs>
um, caused certain areas to be, have a little bit more energy or a little bit less energy. And as the universe expanded, those fluctuations got stretched out over time. And that's all I'm going to say about quantum mechanics for the remainder of this talk. Um, and uh, what happens is that, it, it, so these quantum fluctuations start very small, and they're actually still very small here. I should say, for starters, that this image, the reason we can see this image is because uh, it is imprinted on what we call the cosmic microwave background. This is light that was emitted soon after the Big Bang. It's kind of this last uh, afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, that then has tra been traveling to, through space, and if we look at the sky in radio frequencies using radio telescopes, uh, such as this is a, a radio satellite actually that's in space um, to observe the radio emission from this Big Bang, we can make maps that look like this. Um, but th this image has been generated to really show you which parts are hotter and which parts are colder, but it turns out that the variations between these regions are extremely small. So if green here, which you can't see very much of, is the average temperature of the universe during this time, then the very reddest areas you can see are one thousandth of one percent hotter than that average. And the bluest areas you can see are one thousandth of one percent colder than that average. So if you were in the universe, you would feel very strongly that everything was exactly the same everywhere. Um, but that's not the case. There are actually these very, very small variations in the temperature of the universe. And it turns out that those are extremely important because these temperature variations correspond to density variations. So these hot parts of the universe are a little bit denser than average. The cold parts are a little bit less dense than average. And if you're denser, that means you have more mass and you produce more gravity than an average part in the universe. So if you're sitting in a very dense location, you have more gravity than your surroundings and you pull more stuff towards you. And so you get bigger over time. If you're sitting in an underdense location, you have less gravity and so you lose more stuff over time. So it's kind of like capitalism, and that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer <laughs> over time. Um, sorry, I apologize. Um, but it turns out, but that, that's a really important effect because it is these tiny, tiny fluctuations at the beginning of the universe that will grow and develop to all of the structure that we will see later at the end of the universe. And so the only reason I show you this here is that these are the seeds of all the galaxies that will form over the course of the universe. Now, um, I'm sorry, I, I just I need to keep going just to, keep, uh, to have any hope of finishing in a timely manner. Um, so now I want to show you now simulations of what happens when you start with a very, very slight uh, uh, distribution of densities, and then you evolve that forward in time. So if you take, these de if you take uh, dark matter and gas in the early universe, so remember that early universe is mostly dark matter with some gas kind of along for the ride, um, you give it these slight differences in density, and then you just let gravity do its thing, what you see is something like this. This is a simulation of dark matter in the universe that starts soon after the Big Bang. So it starts with a mostly uniform amount of dark matter, um, but with, very with areas that are slightly more or less uh, dense than others. And what you can see is that these density fluctuations grow, and they keep getting bigger and stronger. Um, and they form these filamentary structures over time. In fact, we call this the cosmic web. And again, there is also gas in the universe besides dark matter. It's been neglected here because the dark matter is producing most of the gravity. And so on these large scales, it's really only dark matter that matters for determining the structure of the universe. But you can imagine that everywhere you see dark matter, there is also gas. And wherever the dark matter is flowing, gas is flowing right along with it. And so you see that these dark matter is flowing. It's forming these filaments and gaseous filaments. It's flowing along these filaments into the centers of what will become galaxies. And so over time, these, these lumps, whatever there was a big lump of dark matter, continues to grow larger and larger. Gas and dark matter flow along these filaments into the centers of these future galaxies, and they continue to get more massive and start to form galaxies over time. And so the important things to take away from this simulation are that uh, dark matter and the gas form these filaments that allow them to bring new material into galaxies and allow them to form. And also uh, that they, they form clumps. So these filaments are really a bunch of clumps of dark matter and gas as well. Um, and what we pull out of these simulations, one of the most important things that we pull out is what the distribution of sizes of these clumps looks like. So you can, this, is, this is a simulation that's zoomed in on this area here, which will eventually become a very massive galaxy. But if you zoomed out, what you would see, and you can already see to some extent here, is that there's a very small number of these very massive clumps. 
And there's a very large number of these very tiny clumps. And in between, there's a continuum of, of clump sizes. And again, when we, when we have a big clump of dark matter like this, we call it a dark matter halo. And so there's a distribution of dark matter halo sizes that eventually we expect will correspond to a distribution of different galaxy sizes. So we can measure the size distribution, what we call the mass distribution of dark matter clumps in these simulations. And then we can make a graph of how many of clumps of each side we see. So this is uh, the mass of your dark matter halo here and how many of, of the halos you see of that mass on this axis. And we get something like this from simulations. A very smooth distribution where there's a lot of low mass halos and a few large mass halos. And because each of these halos has about 20% of its mass in gas, um, we can look at the distribution of gaseous clumps in this simulation and it should look something like this. It's just looks just like this curve, except shifted down because there's not very much gas compared to the dark matter in the universe. And then if you imagine that all of that gas gets converted into stars, then when we go out and look at galaxies and measure how many stars are in them, we would expect to see a distribution of stellar masses that looks just like this line, because all of that gas just turned into stars. But when we do this, when we take surveys of galaxy masses, we get a curve that looks very different. It looks like this. There are a couple things to point out about this curve. One is that everywhere this yellow curve is below the white curve. And that means in no kind of galaxy is all the gas turned into stars. There's always only a fraction of the gas that turns into stars. And secondly, this curve looks particularly different at the low mass and the high mass end. So as you move to low mass halos, stars are, these galaxies are very inefficient at turning gas into stars. And also in the high mass halos, they're especially inefficient at turning gas into stars. And we can understand this because of what we call feedback. Now feedback is what we call the effect that whenever you put gas into a galaxy to try to grow it, it turns out that a lot of energy gets released. And that energy blows the gas back out of the galaxy and cuts off the growth of the galaxy. And um, I, I said that very abstractly. Specifically, what I'm talking about is particularly at this low mass end, there's what we call stellar feedback. So again, if you bring gas into a galaxy, you form some stars. Some of those stars are going to be very massive and very hot. And the light from those stars is enough to ionize and heat the gas and push the gas away to some extent. But even more so, when those big stars die, they have supernovae, which explode the gas and throw it out of the galaxy. And so as soon as you start to form stars, you're going to get some uh, hot stars, you're going to get some supernovae, and then the gas will get thrown back out and you cut off your star formation. And we can simulate this by considering a simulation that's now not just dark matter, but it includes gas, and it includes what happens to that gas as it forms stars. And so it's color-coded now by temperature, so red is the hottest gas, green is warmer, uh, purple is cold, and what you see you're going to see these same filaments that we saw in dark matter, where gas is flowing into a future galaxy along these filaments. But every time it flows in and forms some stars, um, there are going to be some explosions and things like that that heat gas and throw it out of the galaxy. So it's turning red, so it's getting hot, and it's being thrown out of the galaxy. And so if you let this evolve over time, more and more gas flows in, but every time you bring more gas in, you throw more gas out. And so at the end result is that this galaxy is very inefficient at turning that gas into stars, most of the gas ends up in this hot cloud of gas around the galaxy. Um, and of course, this is a simulation, but we can see similar effects in the real universe. Um, this is an example of uh, a nearby galaxy um, that looks very much like our Milky Way. I should say our Milky Way is not doing what I just showed you. Our Milky Way is forming stars only very, very slowly, and so it doesn't have these violent explosions. However, this galaxy, uh, M82, um, one next, one before M83 that I showed you previously. It looks like a pretty typical, maybe, disk galaxy here when we look at the starlight. So this is what we see in the visible spectrum when we're looking at the stars. But if we look in the X-ray, we can see hot gas. And if we look in the infrared, we can see dust that's uh, kind of coming along for the ride of that hot gas. And what we see is that it's being ejected from the galaxy. So this galaxy that looks so normal in terms of its stars is ejecting these huge plumes of hot gas and dust from the galaxy that are being thrown out by the processes I described, supernovae, the radiation from hot stars, etc. Um, 
So that's particularly important down here. Um, so we can, we can call this stellar feedback um, is very effective at cutting off galaxy formation on small scales. But it turns out um, that we need something else to explain galaxy deformation and cut off at large scales because as you move to more massive galaxies, um, you have more and more mass that can hold onto the gas and keep it from being thrown out of the galaxies. And so you need something more powerful than star formation to cut it off. And this is an area that is very well, or that is very poorly understood currently and is a major area of research, but the main candidate we believe is feedback from black holes. Um, and I, I just want to remind you, this is that, that artist's impression of a black hole, or of a quasar that I showed you previously. And as a reminder, this accretion disk here is putting out tons of light. It, it's putting out much more light than the stars that I mentioned. And so it's even more powerful when it comes to heating gas and moving it around. Um, but in addition to the light from the secretion disk, you can see here that there's this jet coming out of the top and bottom of this black hole, coming out of the top and bottom of the disk. Now this jet is, is really not well understood. We don't understand why these black holes produce jets uh, very well at all. Um, but we know that they're incredibly powerful. So this is an image of a nearby galaxy called Cygnus A. Um, you can see this jet that is shooting out of the galaxy throwing these huge amounts of gas and producing these giant uh, plumes. And I just want to bring this home. The, the power of this image is that this is not the black hole at the center. This is the entire galaxy at the center. And so the size of these plumes are huge compared to the entire galaxy. It's clear there's colossal amounts of energy required to produce these kinds of, of features. And so while we don't entirely understand how these jets are formed, um, or how they interact with the gas in galaxies, it's very clear that they have the power to potentially cut off galaxy formation in even very massive galaxies. All right. Um, so now I've given you a picture of our current theory <laughs> of galaxy formation, uh, how we go from the seeds of galaxy formation um, to building these large structures that form galaxies, and then these stars that eventually cut off their own growth over time. Now I want to conclude this talk by saying how we know what I'm describing. And in particular, if you've noticed, I've shown you a lot of simulations. I've shown you galaxies in the local universe and said, oh, this is how the simulations kind of reproduce what we see in the local universe. But I haven't shown you really what the universe looked like for early in times when these gal most of the galaxies like the Milky Way were forming their stars. Because most of the Milky Way stars were formed billions of years ago. Um, so if we want to know what the universe looked like or what the Milky Way looked like a long time ago, um, it's actually pretty easy. All we have to do is look back in time, which might not sound terribly easy. Um, you may or may not be aware we don't actually have time machines currently. Um, sorry to burst anyone's bubble. Um, so we can't just go back in time and watch the, the Milky Way form over time, though that would be pretty awesome. We can do something, however, that's almost as good. We can look at other galaxies as they form. In particular, we can see them forming because the farther a galaxy is away from us, the longer the light it makes takes to reach us. So you may have heard that light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. So whenever you look at the sun, you're actually seeing how the sun looked eight minutes ago, not how it looks this very second. Trippy, don't think about it too much. Um, <laughs> when you look at these galaxies that are billions of light years away, it takes billions of years for the light to reach us. We're seeing the most distant galaxies as they looked billions of years ago when the universe was very young. And so we can look out into the distant, uni distant universe, we can look at the properties of galaxies as they get farther and farther away, and uh, which also means that we're looking farther and farther back in time, so giga years, these are billions of years, and the universe is about 13 and a half billion years old. So these, these farthest galaxies, we're seeing them as they looked very, very early in the universe's history. And what we see is that if you move back to how the universe looked about 10 billion years ago, this is the average star formation rate in galaxies, and that the average galaxy like the Milky Way was forming stars very violently, very strongly at these early times. And so these are the galaxies, these distant galaxies, that we want to study if we want to catch galaxies in the act of forming. And so for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to tell you um, how astronomers like myself are studying these distant galaxies to test our theories of galaxy formation. Um, but now, as you might imagine, if you're looking at galaxies that are billions of light years away, these galaxies are going to be faint and small. And so they're hard to see. Um, you're not going to see them with your backyard telescope. In fact, you need extremely um, powerful technology to study these galaxies. And so I want to start 
by describing a little bit of what that technology looks like. Um, to starters, you need a really big telescope or telescopes. Um, these are my two favorites. They're the Keck telescopes in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. These are that reason why I spend so much time in Hawaii, um, in addition to the beaches. Um, but uh, what you're seeing here are these, these telescope domes that are much bigger than this room, around the size of the size of the, of the, side of the building. Um, and if you go inside them, these domes um, have giant mirrors that we use to collect light. And these mirrors are about 10 meters or 33 feet across. You can see here's a, a regular sized human being in the foreground of that mirror. And the cameras that we attach to the back of these telescopes that actually detect and, and characterize the light that they collect are as big as a car or larger. So these are incredible feats of engineering that allow us to study uh, the distant galaxies in the universe. So once we have some Keck telescopes and some instruments, uh, we can take images of the, of the sky, and uh, very, very sensitive images of the sky, and we can see something that might look like this. This is uh, an image of the sky in one particular patch of the sky that I'm very fond of um, from my own research, actually. Um, and you see there are actually a lot of galaxies in this image. They're a little hard to pick out here. Most of the stuff that you can see with your eye very clearly are not interesting to me at all. It might be interesting to someone, um, but almost all of these very large blobs are stars. Um, and they're not large. They don't, the reason they look large here is not because they're physically large, but because they're so bright that they saturate the detector. And so pretty much all of these very bright things are stars in our own galaxy that, frankly, I'm not very interested in. Um, you do see a couple of galaxies here that you can probably see from the back of the room. There's this little smudge here, this little smudge here. Those are spiral galaxies. But again, these are galaxies that are very close to us, and I'm not very interested in them either. The galaxies that I study look something like this, which you may not be able to see. You'll have to trust me in the back of the room. There's a point there. There's a dot. Um, and in fact, there's not just one dot like that, but there are a lot of them. Each of these red circles corresponds to a distant galaxy that I am currently researching to try to figure out how galaxies form uh, over time and how what they looked like during this time when they were actively forming stars. Um, and I do want to point out real quick, there is one other thing that's very interesting to me in this image besides these galaxies. I told you that almost all these very bright things are stars, and that's true. One of them is not a star. This one is a quasar. And so even though it's just as far away as these galaxies, it's 10 to 12 billion light years away, it looks as bright as the stars are in our own galaxy, and that's because it's around 10,000 bright times brighter than these typical galaxies at that distance. And so I'll come back to this in a little bit, but these, that's what makes these quasars incredibly powerful tools, both for affecting galaxy formation, but also for studying galaxies, as I'll get back to in a little bit. Um, but we might notice is all these little galaxy dots are very, very small. We can't image them in the kind of detail that we can for those galaxies close to us where you saw those beautiful plumes of gas coming out. And so we have to study them in a different way. Um, and this is where it'll get a little bit technical. But what we do is we take all of the light coming from a single galaxy and we break it up by its wavelength. So we put it through a prism or a grating or something like that that separates the blue light from the red light and everything in between. And then we can graph how much light there is at every frequency. And this is called the galaxy spectrum. Um, and what you see is that this galaxy has light at kind of all these different wavelengths. It's pretty flat. Um, but there are specific wavelengths where it has a lot of extra uh, emission or a lot less. Um, and it turns out that this, where the places where there's less are because light is being absorbed. And the place where it has more is because extra light is being emitted. And the reason it happens at specific frequencies is because these correspond to changes in the atoms in these galaxies. So you can get absorption if you have an atom in its ground state and a photon hits it and excites it to a higher state, that photon will be absorbed. If an excited atom decays to a lower energy state, then that will emit a photon, which causes emission like this. Um, and because these electrons and atoms have very specific energy levels, that means that you can only get absorption or emission in very specific wavelengths of light coming from this gas. Um, and so, and each atom, each type of atom, has its own energy levels to the electrons. And so by looking at the wavelengths of this light, we can see what kinds of stuff is in this galaxy. Um, and in particular, these are different absorption lines from uh, heavy atomic species that I'll show you uh, in a second. Um, and this strong emission line here is coming from hydrogen. It's coming from what we call the Lyman-alpha transition of hy hydrogen 
which is this, the transition between the first excited state and the ground state. And that's a really important transition because it's kind of the fundamental transition of the atom, and hydrogen is the most common stuff in the universe. So you put those two things together, and you can see that's why we get so much emission at this one wavelength. And wherever we see light with this wavelength, we know we're looking at hydrogen gas. Um, but if we zoom in on the rest of this spectrum, what we see is that there are all these little wiggles that correspond to little bits of emission or absorption by different types of material in the galaxy. And so we can actually study the chemistry of these galaxies because if there's a line here, that means there's nitrogen. If there's a bunch of lines here, that's iron. And all these other uh, different signatures of different elements in these galaxies. And we can see what elements are there. We can see whether these atoms are ionized to calculate their temperatures. And so we can learn a lot about the physical <coughs> properties of gas in these galaxies, which tells us how are the stars producing heavy elements and are releasing them in supernova? Um, how are these uh, stars blowing gas around in the galaxy um, and heating it up and that kind of thing? Um, and then we can also use these spectra to look at the motion of gas. Um, so as I, as I told you, when, you, when uh, material is blown or moved, it has a velocity towards you, away from you, it changes the wavelength of its emission a little bit because of that, that Doppler-like effect. Um, and so when we measure an, an emission line like this, the width of that emission line tells us about the uh, breadth of the distribution of velocities. It tells us about the velocities of the uh, of the atoms that are causing that emission. And in particular, this line here is one that corresponds to uh, the locations of stars in the galaxy. And so the width of this emission line <coughs> tells us um, about how quickly the stars in the galaxy are moving. And that's really important, because if you remember when we talked about dark matter, it's the velocities of stars and galaxies that can tell us how much mass is in the galaxy. So looking at the width of these lines tells us um, how massive these galaxies are becoming over time. Um, uh, another thing we can do is look at the location of these stars. I'm going to skip through some things because I know it's getting late. Um, and, but also we can look at this Lyman Alpha emission that I described, and you can see that it's much broader than the location of the stars. That means the gas is moving much faster than the stars, and in fact it's being blown out of the galaxies. And if you look at the, the images of the stars and the gas, you can see the gas is much more extended again. So again, we're probing how gas is getting out of these galaxies. Um, but now the last thing I want to talk about um, so th this, is, this is useful because we learn about the gas right around galaxies. But this gas is being lit up by the stars in the galaxy, and uh, the, the stars aren't bright enough to show us what the gas looks like very far from the galaxy. So if we want to look about what the gas looks like on large scales in the universe, we have to use something different. And in particular, so this is again a, the simulation of dark matter in the universe. We expect that these filaments that we see in dark matter simulations also have gas that traces these same structures. If we want to really test our theory of how this gas and dark matter is distributed, we need some way to look at the distribution of this gas and dark matter on very large scales. And you can't do that with the light from galaxies, but you can do it with the light from quasars. And so if you imagine if you have this very bright quasar right here, one of the ways we can look for gas using this quasar is looking for absorption in the light from that quasar. Because if you imagine that we're standing somewhere over here, and the light to the quasar is traveling towards us, it will pass through all these filaments of gas on its way to reach us. And every time that quasar light passes through a filament of gas, some of the light gets absorbed. And so what happens is that when we look at the spectrum of this quasar, as the light travels to it, it picks up these little absorption signatures every time it passes through gas. And so at the end of the day, we have a spectrum that has some areas with very little absorption that correspond to a region with very little gas. We have some parts of the spectrum that show a lot of absorption, and that corresponds to some area where it really passed through a thick filament. And so it, by using uh, the information in this spectra, we can try to then reproduce what does the density of gas look like along our line of sight to the quasar. It turns out this is a really powerful technique. In fact, most of what we know about the distribution of gas in the universe comes from looking at quasar spectra like this and looking for absorption that tells us about the distribution of gas. Um, yeah, and it works really, really well. The only downside of this technique is that even though it's very precise, it only tells us about the gas right along this line. If we want to learn about the three-dimensional distribution of gas, we have to rely on the fact that either you have quasars every single place you look in the sky, which unfortunately isn't the case, um, or you have to find some way to image the gas that's, that's farther away from this line of sight. In particular, we'd really like to learn about the gas that surrounds these quasars, because we'd like to learn how are these quasars themselves being fed by these filaments of gas? And so 
so one way we can hope to do that, and one thing that I'm working on with some other researchers here, is to try to see um, whether if these quasars are emitting light not just towards us, but in all directions, then the light from this quasar could illuminate all this gas around it. And so we, that, that emission is going to be very, very faint, because not very much of the quasar light is going to scatter off of this gas in our direction. But if we can detect it, we can hope to make a map of the universe that might look something like this. Where everywhere that we see a quasar, we get this bubble of, of a region where we can probe the large-scale structure of gas. We can see how that gas is getting into galaxies, feeding stars, feeding quasars. And uh, we can also test whether these filaments that we see in simulations really look the way they do in the real universe. And uh, that's all I have. Um, this is, oh, I'll, just, I'll start with a summary and then that many people clap. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd love you to clap twice, but it's okay. We're limited time. Um, so again, let's just let's, let's rehash this real quick. We begin galaxy formation with the seeds planted in the Big Bang and these quantum fluctuations. Those fluctuations create structure from the dark matter in the universe. The dark matter structures funnel gas along these filaments into galaxies, which form stars. These stars, at the end of their lifetimes, can form black holes. Um, and then, of course, the energy released by these stars and black holes, the feedback, plays a really important role in regulating uh, the transition of future gas into stars. Um, and lastly, the, the one point that I haven't talked about in a little while is you've got the dust that is also created by stars and intermixes with the gas and affects the future uh, populations of stars that result. Um, but also dust is really important for another reason that I alluded to earlier. It creates planets. And in fact, it creates everything we enjoy about planets, such as gardens and lecture halls and astronomers as well. So thank you very much. for the lateness of the hour, but thank you guys for sticking around. I realize some of you are going to need to run, but let's take uh, 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. But feel free to speak out quietly as well. Uh, um, about black holes, why is that? Good question. So uh, there was a question so, sorry, about... Sorry, you all going to leave, could you just do so quietly? Oh, yeah, if you don't mind. Thank you. Question, thank you. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, there's a question... Why is our black hole passive, and why do we see this variability in black holes? Um, there are a couple of reasons. One is that um, whenever these black holes uh, absorb a lot of material and they become very hot, they also blow a gas away, which can cut off the feeding of the black hole itself. So these black holes have feedback on themselves just the way that the stars do. Um, and secondly, just because uh, we think that these black holes are often especially fed during when two galaxies merge, and so if two galaxies have recently merged, you'll probably have a very active quasar that's absorbing material. But if they haven't merged for a while, then basically after a while, the thing is kind of getting to a state where there's nothing else to absorb. And it just sits there until something mixes stuff up and drives a lot of gas back towards the, the black hole. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a question about dark matter. It confuses the heck out of me. If I understood you correctly, the most of the dark matter in the galaxy is external to the visible Good question, um, and the, the answer to that is that I, I think I spoke imprecisely earlier. So there is dark matter in here. It's not in a shell outside of the galaxy. If it was, that would be it would have no effect whatsoever. Uh, rather, um, it, it is it is throughout, and actually the dark matter is densest in the center of the galaxy. It's just that the the baryons, the stars and stuff, are even more dense. So when you're close to it, the dark matter doesn't have an effect so much because uh, you're dominated by the mass of other things. But as it's only as you move farther out that the dominant effect is because yeah, of the dark matter. Thank you. Um, in the black? Yeah. So earlier we talked, you spoke about gaseous hydrogen emitting radio waves. Yeah. And I'm wondering what the mechanism is that uh, generates that. That's a, an excellent question. It's um, one of it's uh, one of the really interesting. Uh, things that uh, are kind of about atoms that we uh, learn, uh, or things about chemistry kind of, that we learn uh, from astrophysics. 
and that it turns out that this this emission is emitted. So uh, because it's radio waves, that means it's a very small energy gap between an excited state and the um, the, the ground state or the bottom state. Um, so if you have a large gap, you're going to see high energy photons in the optical or X-ray. If you have a small gap, you'll see them in the radio. And so it's a transition. It's a very very small energy transition, and it has to do with uh, whether the spin of the electron, so electrons have spin, protons have spin, if those spins are aligned or anti-aligned, there's a very, very tiny energy difference between those things. And it has to do with a bunch of different quantum effects. So it's not like electron shells, it's just different. Exactly, it's just different spin orbits, and that's why it's a much smaller energy than jumping to a whole different shell. It is atomic, though. There are uh, molecular transitions as well, exactly, that, that are also, most of what we see in the radio tends to be um, uh, yes, uh, in our solar system, in the uh, planetary region, including the Kuiper Belt, mm -hmm. it's a disk. The Oort cloud is more or less spherical. Sure. Uh, what's the situation with galaxies? Is the dark matter sphere spherical, or is it the disk, or something else? Right. And finally, yeah. what about dark energy? Okay, good, good question. Yeah. So um, the uh, the answer to the first part of the question is yes, actually. Uh, the dark matter is fairly spherical. Not, not, maybe not exactly a sphere; it could be, you know, a blade or you know this kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it's roughly symmetric. And the reason that disks aren't is because, as I mentioned previously, gas can interact with itself in a way that dark matter can't. Um, so gas tends to interact with itself and lose energy in such a way that it moves towards the center of halos and it also flattens out. It picks one preferred direction where most of its angular momentum is and, and just forms a disk in that orientation. Uh, dark matter doesn't have a way of, of shedding angular momentum or, or uh, interacting with each other and in, in forming that kind of structure. So it is a much more blobby halo in which in the middle you have uh, a disk. As for dark energy, it's usually uh, interesting. It's, uh, in terms of the energy density of the universe, it's even more important than dark matter. Um, but uh, it doesn't actually play a huge role in galaxy formation for a number of reasons. Um, one is that it acts on very large scales, so they're large compared to the size of galaxies. And also because of the way that these different components of the universe, like matter and, and dark energy, evolve over time, uh, in our current universe, dark energy is kind of the most uh, dominant component of our universe. But that's only been the case for the last few billion years. Prior to that, matter was the dominant component of our universe. And because most of these galaxies formed when matter was dominant, it doesn't, that's another reason why it doesn't play a strong role in their evolution. Uh, in the red shirt. Uh, do you know much about the role of uh, statistical techniques in inferring the large scale structure of the universe? To some extent, yes. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, so I mentioned uh, there, there are a number of different surveys and things like that that are working on things like that. Oh, one, I don't know if you have a question about a specific one. One thing that's really interesting, uh, I think, is, uh, well, I should be the absorption coming from a single quasar. Uh, but if you do, ha you can't have quasars at every point in the sky. But if you do have a number of different quasars that are fairly close together, um, you can measure their, um, the absorption of these different quasars and try to correlate between them to map 3D structures. Also, um, even in, a, in individual quasar spectra, even if they're not close together, um, we can say, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, this quasar spectra shows us that there's one structure here and another structure here. That might be interesting. But it's also just interesting to look at that spectrum and say, how many large structures and how many small structures are there? What's the distribution of those? And how does that compare to the distribution of dark matter halo sizes from simulations? So those are two techniques that are really important as well. Is that answer? Yeah. The way that I study galaxy formation is primarily by looking, you know, back in time, the way galaxies looked when they were forming. There's another, you know, very different technique where people do look at our own galaxy and nearby galaxies in a lot of detail to try to, you know, look at all the details and then try to extract how could we have gotten that way. And they're, they're complementary techniques because we can look, for instance, at very small structures in our own galaxy and 
try to figure out sort of satellite galaxies, like you said, that might be orbiting our own galaxy and try to figure out what kind of formation scenario would produce a galaxy that has a lot of satellites versus one that doesn't. And as for the black holes, so currently when we look at dwarf galaxies, um, a big question is whether these dwarf galaxies do have black holes or don't. Um, because they tend to not have a lot of stars and they're very faint, it's hard to, and, and because they're smaller, we would expect black holes in them are also smaller. So they're difficult to detect. So we're not, I think, entirely sure um, how, how that works out and whether it is all galaxies, even very tiny ones that always have these supermassive black holes, or if it's only the massive ones that do, and if that's the case, you know, why, why don't they have them? I think those are open questions. Uh, and back. Good question. Um, honestly, so the, the way they project, you know, so truly this picture, it's of the whole sky. So it would be like the inside of a sphere, you know, looking up in any direction coming from the Earth. Um, but because it's hard to show that on a 2D screen, they project it like this, just like when you look at a, a map of the globe that's truly a sphere, but you try to project it in some way that kind of maintains some kind of sense. So the idea is, you know, here, this is kind of our, the, the horizontal, you know, like the equator. And this is kind of the North Pole, South Pole. Even though those things are arbitrary in terms of the universe as a whole, but in terms of our view of the universe, that's what. Uh, and actually, the, it turns out the, the way they decide on the, the axis for this, this is actually where the disk of our galaxy would be, right down the middle here. So looking up, looking out of our galaxy, or down at that our galaxy. Um, Um, so the question is about if the universe is infinite, kind of what does it mean to be expanding and that kind of thing if it's already infinite? Um, so there, there, that's a complicated question, and um, there are a lot of different elements to it. One is that you can have different sizes of infinities. And so and actually when we do math, we find all the time that you can have this infinity and this infinity, but this one can still be twice as big as this one, for instance. Um, and some kind of, you know, we, we have to, it, you have to do that in a well-defined way, um, and it's kind of counterintuitive. But something can be infinitely large and still on some level get larger. But yeah, usually what we're talking about, usually you know, we're, we're going to talk about, say, the observable universe, which is only that stuff that's close enough to us that the light has had time to reach us over the entire history of the universe. If it's farther away, then the light that was emitted even you know, when it first formed hasn't had time to reach us in the entire history of the universe. So usually, yeah, it's often helpful to just talk about the observable universe. And we can clearly say that the entire observable universe should have been compacted down to a single point. And, that, and so that's what we would call the Big Bang, more or less. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Um, in the far back? Yeah. Um, in Patton, you just kind of alluded to the fact that gas is forming planets, but you haven't um, indicated the how significant the planet attracts gas in our to the whole uh, concept. Right. That's a good, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. I haven't talked really about planets at all. Um, uh, that's mostly because they, they actually don't make up very much of galaxies, even if uh, we're, we're now finding that most stars seem to have planets around them. But still, even in our solar system, even with our eight planets, the planets only make up about 0.15% of the mass of our solar system. So it's really not significant in terms of how the whole galaxy forms. But yeah, the, this idea of how planets attract gas and all that is very interesting for figuring out how planets get atmospheres and that kind of thing. I'm aware of time, so let's just take one more question. Yeah, one more. Better make it a good one. <laughs> go, go ahead. Please. Okay, dark matter. Two questions. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> two parts. Uh, um, you've got the periodic table. Yeah. With different elements. Right. Where does dark matter show up? Excellent. And question. what are the parts to a doubt? You know, an atom is made of this and that. What's dark matter made of? Right. Excellent question. That's a major area of current research. Uh, things like the uh, collider at CERN, you made, like the Large Hadron Collider. You, you've seen this documentary, Particle Fever. It's really, really interesting. It tells you about how particle physicists here on Earth are trying to learn more about the kind of exotic types of matter that we're starting to see some evidence for in space. Um, the main question is, so the, the dark matter would not fall on the periodic table because things on the periodic table are all actually pretty similar to each other. They're all made of electrons, neutrons, and protons. We believe that um, a dark matter particle, whatever it is, would be something that is not made of protons, neutrons, electrons, because those things all interact with light. Um, there are other types of galaxy, I mean, sorry, other types of particles we know of um, that we learn of from uh, particle physics and from these colliders that are not, uh, you know, the, those protons, neutrons, electrons. And so we do have a lot of evidence that there are these other types of massive particles that, um, 
you know, could potentially be, you know, would, are similar to what a, a supposed dark matter particle in certain ways. Um, but currently, none of the particles that we've detected um, seems like it would be an acceptable solution to, to uh, generate the effects that we see from dark matter. So, still working on it, both from observations in space and, and experiments on the ground. So, thank you guys so much.